Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Did you guys enjoy last night's topic? Wasn't that great? Good information. Glad you're back tonight. We I knew so we, we I see some new faces tonight. So just as a fresh reminder, um, those that are here for the first night, out the doors and down the hall to your left, and for your first right, there's a hall. There's two. The, that's where the bathrooms are. Uh, we do, because of the COVID, we're trying to make sure we are taking well care of everybody. So we do uh, have four air filters going through here. Uh, we uh, fogged it last night or this morning. We got to make sure everybody's got their mask. We're doing checks at the beginning. So, And not only are we providing that to help you with this COVID, but we're also putting on this seminar, right? It's going to help boost that immune system so you can fight off um, what comes around. So again, we thank you for coming tonight. Those that are online, I'm glad you are joining us this evening. Uh, I apologize if you were running into some troubles last night, but we think we got all those kinks worked out. So hopefully you're, you're watching us and you got to see the video from last night. Also, we sent you some handouts. Hopefully you got those and are able to participate as well. So. Again, thank you for coming tonight. We have a great topic. Do remember anybody remember what the topic is tonight? When hearts attack, right? So we'll turn it over to Rico. Thank you very much for coming again. And at this time, we're ready for you guys to take your notes. Thank you so much, Mark. Appreciate it. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to From Sickness to Health. I see some old friends that I didn't see last night, so I'm really, really blessed and highly favored to see you here tonight. And new friends. So welcome back to everyone, and those of you who missed last night, and those of you who might be joining us live streaming for the first time, we welcome you as well. I'm Rico Hill. I'm the speaker, your health motivator, your health speaker, and I am here because I want to see you go from a life of sickness to a life of health. And that is especially important right now, isn't it? That's very important right now because we are right in the midst of, some of us, some think that we're at the tail end, others say that things could heat up, but we are right in the midst of, for argument's sake, of a global pandemic. Now, many of us who are as young as I am don't really remember when there was ever such a thing. Really, there's never been anything like this the world has ever grappled with, where on every continent there are extreme and radical measures that are taking place in order for us to beat this thing. Well, we believe, this organization believes, this church believes that we can beat it by informing you, helping you to be informed about how you can take care of yourself, how you can strengthen your immune system, how you can avoid many of the negative side effects and after effects of someone who has been um, affected by COVID-19 coronavirus. So tonight, we're gonna continue in that vein and we're going to be talking about tonight when hearts attack. When hearts attack. Now, I love this title. And the reason why I like this title so much is because it speaks of a truth. And that truth is, is that many people have this misconception about what takes place when a person has a heart attack. As if the heart has attacked them. Oh, nothing could be further from the truth. Your heart loves you. It beats for you. It longs to take care of you, but you have to take care of it. So with that said, let's get into our night's topic, When Hearts Attack. And I'd like to start out by just showing you a little video. I mentioned last night that I have a little show called From Sickness to Health, after the same name of this seminar. In fact, this seminar is named after it. And I appear with a guy who's blue, and he represents sickness. And in this little clip I'm going to show you, 
he has this misconception that I'm talking about. Yeah, that's right, my heart attacked me. Make the record straight, my heart attacked me. Ungrateful heart, so you're mad at your heart. Yes, I'm mad at my heart. I am taking care of this thing. Oh. Hello, heart attack hotline? Yes, I'd like to report a vicious attack. So you see, I'd like to use that as an illustration to show you how people are so off in terms of their understanding of what takes place when there's a heart attack. Now, I won't get into all the science of what takes place with a heart attack. I'd rather inform you rather than, you know, giving you a bunch of information about what a heart attack is. I'd like to tell you how to avoid one, how to not be a statistic. And there are some staggering statistics about exactly what happens when someone has a heart attack. But before we get into those things, let's talk about some of the key takeaways from last night. Key takeaways from last night. We learned last night that the U.S. ranks low, spends more, but we have worse results than just about every industrialized, advanced nation in the world. Spend more, but we get worse results. We also looked at to have good health. I love this idea. It is the most basic concept of health. I tell you, if people embrace this idea, we would see such better health all around the world. And you're privileged tonight. You're privileged this entire week to see exactly some of these very, I love the basics. I like the simple things. Don't give me a lot of diets and, you know, fad diets and all this kind of stuff. Just give me the basics. And the basics simply are, you know what? You want to have good health? Make sure that you have good blood. And make sure that your blood is circulating at the rate it should, and you will have good health. That is so simple, isn't it? Now, you're probably wondering. I know I'm in, right in the midst of my key takeaways, but I got to tell you this right at this point. It is so simple. How do you have good blood? Do you have good blood? Well, you know, it's interesting to me that People used to wonder whether, you know, I, I love getting a lot of my information from the Bible. I love the sciences in the Bible. And there is a verse in the Bible that says, listen to this, it says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And no one paid attention to that for years and years and years and years until we started to draw blood, and now we can see everything that's going on in your body pretty much, pretty much, by just looking at your blood. Looking at your blood work. Isn't that the first thing you get when you go get a physical? When you haven't been to the doctor, go to your primary care physician, they want to know, let's take a little blood sample and let's see what's going on with you. You can see, see what's going on with your blood sugars. You can see what's going on with your, whether you have cancer or not. You can see what's going on with men. We can find out what's going on with our prostate. All these things we can do by looking at our blood. Now, there are things that we can do that will make our blood impure. There are certain things that we can eat that will make our blood impure. Well, when you drink alcohol, do you think that affects your blood? Of course it does. That's why they will check and see what your blood alcohol levels are, right? <laughs> of course. Now, when you smoke, do you think that they can tell a, a smoker from looking at their blood work? Absolutely. Absolutely. All of these things make your blood impure, but also what you eat, and if you smoke and things like that, it will slow down the circulation of that blood, right? So I love that definition, and we sh shared that last night. Thank you. Can you give just a round of applause to Edgar and his team? They're doing all the audio visual, and you know what? This is a mammoth task for them to do. For those of you who are online, we can't hear you clapping, but clap for them as well as those here because they are literally not, on, not only filming this, but they are broadcasting. For those of you who are watching on YouTube or Facebook Live, they are juggling all those things at the exact same time. So we want to thank you guys for the work that you're doing. And not to mention that, you know, when you're doing as many things as they are, and so many moving parts, things can go wrong in a hurry, you know what I mean? But they are doing a very good job, and we thank you for the work that you're doing. 
Now, we also looked last night at five habits that, the, that people can incorporate in their lives to be healthy, to extend your life, to add years to your life. And it's, let me kind of pause there for just a second. It's not so much, it's not so important to add years to your life or add time to your life, but to really add life to your time or life to your years. You understand what I mean by that? I mean, what does it matter if you live to be 100 and you can't enjoy yourself? It matters not. You'll be, oh, most miserable. But what if you could add quality of life to your years? And really, that's what we're talking about as we go through night after night. And we looked at five habits. Does anyone remember any of those habits? Right at the top of the list, right number one, what was it? It's all about a healthy diet. That's A number one. Exercise, now that gets your blood, your blood rate going, right? Your heart rate going, gets your blood circulating, and that is good for your health, right? Maintain ideal weight. And we saw last night as we talked about COVID-19 that this is especially important that we get our BMI down. Whatever you can do. Now, it's not an easy thing, so we're not going to be hard on anybody. We know this is challenging, but the time has come for us to do our very best. And we have to ask ourselves, are we doing our best? Number four was avoid alcohol, and number five was avoid cigarette smoking, right? Very, very simple things. Then we also looked at last night some of the COVID-19 risk factors. Anyone remember what those were? I will remind you. I will remind you that if you have high blood pressure, you are twice as likely to be affected in the most negative and most adverse way by COVID-19 coronavirus. If you have high blood pressure, even worse, if you are, if you have, uh, you have high blood pressure, hypertension, and you are taking medication, certain ones. And you might want to look into some of the very specific drug medications that you could be taking that actually seems to be causing a lot of problems and making people much more susceptible, right? And then if you have cardiovascular disease, which we're talking about tonight, you're three times as likely to be uh, affected by coronavirus and then end up in the hospital on a ventilator in ICU. So, we want to avoid that, and we want you to avoid that. So, want to make sure that you remember, that was one of our takeaways from last night. Don't want you to forget. Now, this, um, this other area that I want you to remember, that we looked at the blue zones. Blue zones, remember that? What kind of a class is this? I want to see if you remember. Do you remember who had the longest living women? The, the, Japan, Okinawa, Japan, the people online, they got to me fast. I heard them. No, I didn't really hear them. But, hey, by the way, I'm here speaking to this audience. For those of you who are streaming and watching me online, I'm speaking to an audience, and they are lovely, by the way. They all have masks on. But while they're safe, it does, it does present somewhat of a challenge for me because I'm used to looking out in the audience and seeing smiling faces. And I can't tell if you're smiling or not. I know you're smiling. Marcia, you're smiling. I can, you're, sometimes people have smiling eyes, right? And I can tell you're smiling. But some, I just can't figure it out. You look like you want to kill me. But I know that that's not the case, right? Because I'm sharing great information with you. You don't want to kill me. Um, but I'm going to try something. We're going to be together for the next few nights. And for those of you at home, I'm sure you don't have on a mask. You're just sitting there in the comfort of your own home, and you're relaxing, and everything is fine. But those of you who are in the audience, and if you decide to come down and be with us here in the audience in person, you certainly can do that because there's plenty of room, and we have taken the necessary precautions. By the way, we heard from Mark that they fogged the place. Now, I don't have the foggiest idea of what that means, but I'll tell you what. They did it last night with two things that was... Spraying something out from here and something in the back. So I know that you're going to be safe if you should come down here and be with us. But let's try something here in the audience. If I'm resonating with you, and if you're paying attention, and it's making sense to you, I want you to just blink your eyes. That's the only thing I got. That's the only thing I can work with. Just blink. Let me know you're living, okay? There you go. Oh, there, there you go. Willie, my friend Willie, he's over there. He's nodding his head. Now, I know he's blinking and nodding. That means he's getting it twice as much. So this is the norm that we will establish here. All right? Is that good? All right. Okay, so we talked about the blue zones, and he just mentioned that 
Okinawa, Japan had the longest living what? Longest living women. And then does anyone remember who had the longest living men? Sardinia. This is a good class. Sardinia. And what country is that in? Italy. See, now, you don't think people are paying attention. Maybe you can't hear them, but they are rattling off the answers, and maybe you are doing the same there at home. So Sardinia, Italy had the longest living men up in the highlands of Sardinia, Italy. And then it was Icaria, Greece, and then we have the Nicoya Peninsula of, of Costa Rica. You're right, you're right, you got it. So there was Costa Rica, and then finally we saw that there was a long living group of people right just to the south of you, been having some problems with some fires. Does anyone remember what area that was? It was Loma Linda, California, among the Seventh-day Adventists. They are living seven to ten years longer. And what we saw is that the principles that you see behind me, and the ones that I'm talking about, this idea of healthy diet and exercising and actually uh, getting out into nature and being amongst positive social groups and things like that, they're the ones who are doing that. And we see that there's a common thread that runs between Okinawa, Japan, and Sardinia, Italy, all the way over to Loma Linda in Costa Rica. They all share this same thing. They eat right. They exercise, right? So, if it's working for them, it can work for who? Oh, you all don't sound excited about that at all. If it works for them, it can work for who? It can work for you. That's exactly right. So that's what we want to show you, that you also can live seven to, seven to 10 years longer. And not only that, you can actually, in those living years, be healthier, happier, have a lot of energy, and you can avoid many of the things that others may succumb to simply because you have a strong immune system, you've got a strong heart, because you are following these wonderful principles. Now, the final thing was we saw that, that oh, I wanted to mention to you that as we talk about the heart tonight, I want you to remember that there's something, there's an ingredient that many people don't catch. Last night, I mentioned, I talked about lifestyles, lifestyles of the rich and famous, remember that? And I mentioned something, and I got to mention it again. People who were of ancient Rome and those who were more recently of the lifestyles of the rich and famous, which we see, you know, even to this day, there are lots of people who have tons of money. They have, I mean, they have a lot of money. Sometimes they're multi-millionaires ten times over, and sometimes they're billionaires. But you know what? When it comes down to it, what does it matter if you have a lot of money and you don't have your health? It is said that a person will spend all of his energy and expend his health in order to get wealth. And then he'll take all of his wealth to try to regain his health. We don't want that. But we saw with those who were among the rich and famous that Robin Leach often talked about, and he being someone who had high blood pressure and died relatively young, I like to say, 77 years of age, you know. And you all say, well, 77, that's, you got to live a good life, a long life. Well, not based on what we're talking about. You know, your heart was designed to beat forever. Your body was designed to live forever. Can you imagine? Can you wrap your heads around that? Designed to live forever. But we found that whether you were in ancient Rome or ancient Egypt or among the rich and famous, and you had a lifestyle that was one where you didn't eat right, didn't exercise, ate high of the hog, as it were, as they say. You had a lifestyle that you loved but didn't love you. And I want you to get this point. No matter where I go, I always emphasize that this is really about what takes place here in this heart. If you don't love it, you won't do it. If you don't love what I'm saying, it will just be information to you. And it'll just go here and it won't move. But we find that when information moves from here to here, it becomes actualized, it becomes real. So my job over the next four talks is to help you love this information. And one of the things that's 
a gentleman by the name of Dean Ornish did, he talked about those same principles. And in those principles, he talked about the same thing of eating well, eating well number one. Number two, moving, more movement, right? So he was still talking about exercise too. He was talking, just as I mentioned, he's talking about good circulation. Yeah, all right? He talked about not stressing, not having a life filled with stress. And then he said, love more. Now, he's a doctor, and he's a doctor, and you're going to see in just a few moments as we talk about hearts, because he wrote a book called Reversing Heart Disease. And he knows a lot about the heart, right? He helped Bill Clinton. Is Bill Clinton still living? Is he still? He's still living because this man helped him actually understand that his heart was never attacking him, but instead he was attacking his own heart, and he showed Bill Clinton how to love his heart with a diet that loves him. Oh, people have never heard that before when I say that. I said that just a few weeks ago, and somebody said, wow, and the light went on. A light bulb went on in their head, and they said, wait a minute, I've been eating foods that I love, but those foods didn't love me. Now, if this kind of doesn't make sense to you, it's okay. Let me help, let me help you understand it a little, a little further. I like that he, fa- he says love more, and it just doesn't mean just love people. It means love your life. Love your life. And when you love your life, you do things in your life. You treat yourself as if you love yourself. Now, I'm not talking about getting so caught up in self-love. That's a whole nother trip. I'm talking about just having enough care and love for your own heart and your own body and your own mind to the extent that you do the things that keep you healthy. But I was sharing this idea of eating the foods that love you. And think about, what does love do? Any parents here? Any parents out there? Parents, what do you do? What did you do when you had children who were young? Did you protect them? Were you willing to sacrifice for them? Right? These words, me even defend them. I always think about my kids. I said, you know what? And I pray to God. And I said, God, protect them and defend them because I know he loves them. Because he loves them more than I love them. And I think about that love. And those words, protect and defend and sacrifice, they all speak of love. Do you know, and you you can't miss Sunday, because on Sunday I'm going to really show you as I go through nutrition, oh, this is a presentation on nutrition you've never seen before. I'm going to show you I've got this presentation. You all have never seen it. I've never brought it here before. It's one of my new presentations. It's called, you want to hear what the name of it is? Do you want to hear the name? All right, then. The name of it is Collards, that's short for collard greens, Collards and Kale, a love story. (laughs) Yeah. Collards and Kale, a love story. And I show how there's love in them there, Collards. There's love in the kale. Because why? When you eat them, they actually love you because they protect you. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. When you take them into your system, they defend you. They become a part of your immune function. You, You hear the love in that? Oh, yeah. There's love. There are foods that when you eat them, they're good for your heart. You're starting to hear more of that all the time, right? Foods that are good for your heart, good for your brain, good for your arteries, good for your, and you can just go down the list. These foods love you because they protect you. Oh, but we want the ones that don't like us very much. Oh, they taste good. Yes, ice cream, cake, cookies. Don't worry, I'm not going to beat you up about that. I love my cookies. I'm just temperate when it comes to them, that's all. But I got to tell you, a lot of meats and high fatty foods, and oily foods, potato chips. I'm going to show you something on potato chips soon. But all those types of foods, they don't love you because they don't protect you. Instead, they're constantly working against you. But just a little preview for Sunday. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. All right. So we want to love more, and we want to love the foods that love us, 
right? It's a con new concept, new concept, but we'll talk some more about that. All right, let me talk about the heart. Let's break down a little bit about the heart, okay? The heart is amazing. I told you, your heart loves you more than you love it. It beats for you. It's about the size of a man's fist or two hands clasped together. Yeah, yeah. And it is an amazing, amazing organ. See those electrical, electrical charges going through it? Yeah, yeah. There, there is something called a sinoatrial node. And that sinoatrial node, it actually is, is basically your inbred design for a pacemaker that's in your heart. And it is always working as long as you are loving your heart. That's love. And that thing will beat and beat and beat because it wants you alive. That's a wonderful design, isn't it? Now, you need to know that the first sign of a heartbeat is around four weeks. Four weeks. Early on. That's amazing. So very early on. Now, that right there, what you see is a hummingbird. Hummingbird has the fastest beating heart, 10 times per second, 10 times, smallest heart, 10 times per second. The blue whale, 400 pound heart, as big as a go-kart. Can you imagine the sound of that heartbeat, right? Amazing. Now, powerful science. In the Bible, it shows that it's true that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine because when you have a uh, happiness and joy, it's good for your heart right? And what do you think is the best thing for your heart? Yes, it's physical movement. It's exercise. That's the best thing for your heart. Now, back in 1923, there was a man who won a horse race at the Belmont Stakes. His name was, that was his name. It went by too fast. But basically, he won the race. He came in first place, but he lost his heart and his life. Frank Hayes died as he crossed the finish line of a massive heart attack. Moral of the story, don't let your horse have a healthier heart than you. He may finish the race without you. You are all saying, I don't have that as a problem. I don't have any horses. The point is still the same. Your heart is wonderful. It pumps in an hour. In just an hour, a gallon and a half of blood, it's going to beat 100,000 times before this day is over. You are fearfully and you are wonderfully made. Now, let me give you a little bit of science. A little bit of science. Now, the Journal of, Ameri of American Medical Association, it looked at 300 autopsies of American casualties. These are people who died suddenly. And at the average age of 22, 77% of them had visible evidence of coronary atherosclerosis, it's hardening of the arteries, right? This was back in 1953. Has, the, has what we eat and diet, has that changed since 1953? Oh, yes, it has. Absolutely, it has. But... 77% had visible evidence of heart disease, of cardiovascular disease. Now, do you, remember, do you see the age? What's the age? 22. That's young. Now, more research for you, American Heart Journal. It looked at accidental death victims, very similar, between the ages of 3 and 26. A little older, but still in that very young age range. And they found first stage of same thing. Atherosclerosis, that's the fatty streaks. This is the precursor to cardiovascular disease and, and all of the issues that come along with that. And this was found in nearly all American children. By what age? Do you see that? Do I have to tell you? Do I have to say it? By the age of 10? That seems almost criminal. So much so that Michael Greger, who wrote the book, How Not to Die, great book. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's an excellent book as it looks at how to avoid an early death. And he said, the question isn't whether or not you want to eat healthier to prevent heart disease, but whether or not you want to reverse the heart disease, you very likely already have. 
Now, you must consider with me that if 1953, that looking at 300 casualties, whether they were military or otherwise, of those who had died in early age, by 22, they already had heart disease. And in this study, the one that I just mentioned, where they looked at those who had had sudden death, and that by the age of 10, they already had heart disease. This is very serious, especially very serious in the age of COVID-19 coronavirus, as I mentioned last night. Listen to me very carefully. This is very important to me. I cannot tell you. These are the things that keep me up at night. I have been studying very diligently where we are, the events that are taking place in our world, why we're all sitting here in a, a sanctuary or you're at home. Now, you're probably someone at home who normally would come to a health talk, but because of the world we live in today, you've taken those precautions and you've stayed home. And it's understandable. So I've looked at where we are, and I have to tell you, friends, this, the information that I'm sharing with you, is very, very serious. I mentioned last night that it is no time for play play. The things that are being shared are not just good information. It must move from here down to your heart. You must embrace this with everything you got. I'm sad to say, and I don't mean to bring down the, the, the room. <laughs> I really don't. But I'm, I'm starting to get word of those who have actually... Because sometimes people say, well, you know, I don't know anybody who's died. Well, that's starting to change for me. Maybe it's starting to change for you, too. It's a serious thing. But what is being shared with you is designed to help you and I, your family, your friends, your loved ones, your neighbor. This information is designed to keep you safe beyond the Purell, beyond the Clorox bleach and the disinfectants, beyond the mask, beyond the social distancing. This is what you need to know, as I shared last night, the best thing, the best, the very best thing that you and I can do is make sure that what's going in our bodies from our diet and what's on our plate is in line with the principles that are being shared. That is number one. And get out in the fresh air, get out in the sunshine. It's the principles that we have right behind me. So it's not so much changing your diet to avoid heart disease, but it might be more about reversing the heart disease that you already have. I pray that you don't, but the time is now for us to start looking at this seriously. This is how serious it is, because you know, sometimes we, we look at the amount of deaths that take place. Even right now, we're calculating every, uh, every day. You know, if you watch the, certainly if you watch CNN, you know, They've got that ticker up there all the time, letting you know, right? So there's no way to avoid it. But look at this little video. Over 17 million people die every year from cardiovascular disease. It is the leading cause of death around the world. Nearly one out of every three people will die from this disease. The amount of people who die from cardiovascular disease is the equivalent of four jumbo jets crashing every single hour, every single day, Every single year. You never heard it like that before, have you? That really puts it into perspective. And as we do the tally and count how many people are dying from coronavirus, but you never hear about the millions of people who die every year from heart disease, right? I, I guess it's not sensational, sensational enough for us to really talk about, but I'm here to tell you, we need to talk about it. And if you happen to be in the African American community, you really need to talk about it because much higher than the general population is the incidence of heart disease and heart attacks and stroke that is happening within the African American community. And we have to take that very seriously. Highly preventable, as I mentioned last night, 
75% of the lifestyle issues that we suffer, 75% is by our own choice. It's based on typically what we eat, what we drink, and our lifestyle. Do we exercise? By the way, what's the, what's the best exercise you can do? I hear, I hear jogging, I hear walking. I, it's the exercise that you do and stick to it. If you want the body of a swimmer, swim. You want the body of a runner, run. You want the legs of a hiker, hike. I like hiking. Hiking is fun. You don't feel like you're really exercising, right? But if walking is your thing, I like, I love my walk. Recently, recently, I think since the last time I was here, I've, my life has changed a little bit. I purchased a farm. Yeah, yeah. I purchased a farm, got a few acres, and I love to walk around my property. I grow my own food. I was a freshman farmer this year. I grew collards. That's why I came up with that title. I grew collards and kale. And let me tell you something. I love my five-mile walk. I would do it every day if I could. I try to get in about four or five days a week, five miles. I want to be around to keep telling people, like I'm telling you, what you can do so that you're around and you can tell other people. Doesn't that sound like a good plan? That's a very good plan. I tell you, you tell somebody else. You tell them, they tell somebody else. And we have a healthier, happier population. Is that right? But we don't talk about the fact that there are 500,000 heart disease. By the way, what are the symptoms of a heart attack? A heart attack. And usually it's death. Boom, done. And 500,000 people a year. Every 30 to 60 seconds, somebody's having a heart attack. Since we've been sitting here, there have been many heart attacks. Especially tonight. Tonight. Do you know why tonight? Because it's Monday Night Football. Monday Night Football, and if your team is losing, people get very excited. And the, and the science shows that when people watch sports and they have been eating the wrong foods for a long time, oftentimes they get very excited and they have a heart attack. So on tonight, some people are going to die because of the National Football League. That's true. So 500 some thousand people die from a heart attack or have a heart attack. And then here's the thing that troubles me. 700 and some thousand, I believe it's 735,000 according to CDC, have a second heart attack. How? Please explain to me, how is it that someone has a first heart attack and then the numbers jump up with those who have a second heart attack? What happened to those people after that first one? They went back to doing the same thing. Someone just said here in the audience, let me ask you a question. Why did they go back to doing the same things? Because they didn't know any better. Well, after tonight and after this series, oh, you'll know better. You'll know much better because that's our aim. That's our goal. Now, Let's start to unpack and look at some of the reasons why somebody might have a second heart attack, why someone might even have the first heart attack, why someone would have cardiovascular disease, why someone would even have, at 10 years old, the beginning stages of atherosclerosis, the, art, the hardening of the arteries, at 10 years of age. It was an AP article just a few years ago. It says, even without modern day temptations like fast food or cigarettes, People had clogged arteries some 4,000 years ago, according to the biggest ever hunt for the condition in mummies. I mentioned last night to you that among the Egyptians, they preserved the body so well that those arteries were intact. You could still tell what they died from. In other words, if you're talking about seeing that there would be blockage in the arteries, you can still see that blockage. That's how well preserved they were. And this article in the AP, that ran in the AP, they, they point out, notice what this study goes on to say. 
it says that researchers suggest that heart disease may be more a natural part of human aging rather than being directly tied to contemporary risk factors like smoking, eating fatty foods, and not exercising. So it's a natural part of your life. This just happens, friends. Do you buy that? Do you believe it? That it just happens? You don't have to do it. You can eat whatever you want, smoke as much as you want to. It's just a part of life. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. Do you believe that? Oh, I don't believe it. Notice what it goes on to say. It gets a little tricky here. It says heart disease has been stalking. Boy, that's a verb, isn't it? Stalking. Heart disease has been stalking mankind for over 4,000 years all over the globe. This is what one of the lead uh, researchers said, author of the study. He says it's been stalking us, hiding behind the bushes, hiding in the alleyways, waiting to attack you. Thompson said, that's that lead guy, the lead author, he was surprised to see hardened arteries even in people like the ancient Aleutians who were presumed to have a healthy lifestyle because they were hunter-gatherers. Hunters-gatherers. But they had heart disease. What word do you hear in this scenario that puts them in a risk? In a, you got it? Hunters, that's right. They're hunters. What were they hunting? Were they hunting tomatoes? Well, they're hunting tomatoes, which, of course, if you hunt tomatoes, you know, that would be a good thing because the seeds in the tomatoes are excellent for the heart, it turns out. Right? Helps with the blood platelets, which is the precursor for a lot of the issues you might have with heart, heart attack and stroke in the first place. You know, one of the things that I learned, I like to make things simple. And I grew tomatoes this year. I did. Let me take it. Here's a little tip. If you plan on uh, having your own little... Uh, organic farm. Here's a little tip. If you don't really, really love cherry tomatoes, only plant one bush. Because if you plant more than one, they will just keep coming and coming and more and more, you know. But you know what? Here's the thing. I didn't normally like tomatoes. I don't like tomatoes. I can eat them on a sandwich, but not on a salad. I know it's weird. I know it's, it's crazy. But that's how I've been for the longest time. I can put a little slice on a, on a sandwich, but put it in a salad, oh, I will take it out and give it to somebody else. It's not for me. But when I, I learned something, when I grew my own tomatoes, when I grew my own tomatoes, even the cherry tomatoes and a few other types, uh, Roman tomatoes, when I grew them myself, I wanted to see if, I, want, I decided I would give them one more chance. And I took one of those cherry tomatoes and I decided I would do like my daddy used to do. He would take a tomato and he would just put a little salt on it and he would bite it just like it was fruit. And I thought that was so disgusting. I said, that's not an apple. <laughs> but I, de I decided to try it and I bit into that thing and let me tell you what. When you grow your own vegetables, it's a whole nother world. Oh, you can't stop me from eating tomatoes now. But here's the thing that I learned. I learned a lot about gardening, all right? And what I learned is that, very simple, if you take a fork and a knife, a sharp knife, right, and you just kind of, uh, by the way, on my little farm, my neighbors are cows to the left. If I took a knife and fork and just, you know, sort of like the guy said about how you can stalk you know, we're being stalked by heart disease. If I went out and stalked one of the cows and just crept up on him, you know, and I went to poke him and get myself a little something, would he just stand there? Would he? He would run, wouldn't he? I noticed something about tomatoes. They just sit there, and they're green at first, and then they turn a beautiful red when the sun hits them. And then you go to them, and you go to grab it. They just go, take me, I'm yours. And you can just pick them. They don't run from you. I have concluded that the things we should eat don't run from us. They don't run from us. 
They just say, I'm yours, take me. And we find that these things are good because they love us. And like I said, all that seedy goodness inside of that tomato is excellent for the heart. Don't toss those seeds away. Eat the seeds. Now, here's a little video. Remember I told you that Dean Ornish, the guy who wrote Reversing uh, Heart Disease, and also he wrote a book called Undo It, because here's the good news. Whether you have heart disease and if you've been years and years and years and years taking things into your body that might be causing you to have cardiovascular disease, cause you to have those fatty streaks, cause you to have these, you know, heart pains, you know, having irregular heartbeats, angina pain, all these things. The science shows you can reverse it. Don't take it from me, take it from what happened with Bill Clinton. I spent time with him and saw that he looked tired, not himself. Got all pale and weak. And then uh, I got all these letters from the, you know, the doctor crowd saying, yeah, it's normal because it feels like you won't do what you're supposed to do because you don't eat like you should do all that stuff like you did. The doctor said it was a mechanical failure of the bypass, and he needed stents to open the blocked artery. I got so lucky they were able to put those two stents in, you know, and, and fix an artery that it did was pretty bad nothing. The goal of the treatment, and I think it will be achieved, is for President Clinton to resume his uh, very active lifestyle. Uh, this was not a result of um, either his lifestyle or his diet, which have been excellent. But Dr. Dean Ornish didn't see it that way. And so I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, the friends that mean the most to me are the ones that tell me what I need to hear, not necessarily what I want to hear. And you need to know that your genes are not your fate, that, and I say this not to blame you, but to empower you. And I'm happy to work with you to whatever extent you, you want to move forward in that way. And we met a few days later and he said he was ready to do it. I essentially concluded that I Did you hear that? What did you hear? I heard a couple things. Number one, I heard from the doctor, who was a really good doctor, is a really good doctor. You know, presidents have the best doctors. You know that, right? They have the best doctors you can imagine. So as you look at even what's going on with the former, I mean, with the current president, and the fact that he came down with COVID-19 and, you know, he was at Walter Reed Hospital and then he went back to the White House. Uh, what you need to understand is that the doctors at the White, ha White House are better than the ones at the hospital in terms of the care that he would need to continue on. I mean, they have excellent doctors, whether they go to, the, to Walter Reed or whether they are at, their, at the White House. They're getting excellent care. That's the point. So they're good doctors. Would you agree with that? High paid, they're the best. That's why you notice that, you know, I think it was Jimmy Carter who had a, a birthday just last week. He turned about 94, 95, 93, something like that. He's in his 90s now. And um, Senior Bush, he lived a, a long life, well into his years. Presidents live a long time because they get excellent care. They do. But on this case, in this case, Something went wrong, and we heard it, and there was an intervention. Did you hear it? That doctor said, we want you to know the problem for Bill Clinton was not his lifestyle or his diet. Not his lifestyle and not his diet. Now, you may recall with me seeing Bill Clinton jogging early in the morning, which we thought was great. Sometimes before the sun comes up with the Secret Service detail right behind him in tow, right? And then you see him run straight to McDonald's. And he would get, that early in the morning, he would get a quarter pounder, and he would get french fries, and he would get, an, he loved apple pies. Yeah. He, he admitted it. They were constantly trying to get him to stop eating like that. But yet, that doctor said, wasn't because of his lifestyle, wasn't because of his diet. Now, there could be a couple things going on with that. Number one, they have found a correlation. They have found a correlation when they looked at the doctors, you know, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, you know, they were really pushing cigarettes to doctors. Did you know that? 
They had campaigns that took place where they were like, you know, my doctor smokes Winston's, and, right? And what was it? Lucky what? Lucky, Lucky Stripes. My mother used to smoke Winston's, by the way, and she had heart disease, triple bypass heart surgery. But the doctors themselves used to smoke, and the whole idea was if you can get the doctor to smoke, that doctor is less likely to tell his patients that they shouldn't smoke. Catch that? They found that as a correlation, right? The corollary, corollary there. And now today, in the 21st century, they're finding that when doctors don't eat a certain way, they are less likely to tell their patients to eat better. Same correlation, right? Even though there is an abundance of data to show that a plant-based diet is the number one way to have good heart health. Full stop, period, right? But this doctor said it wasn't because of his lifestyle. So that's part of the reason. So you have scientists who are saying that heart attacks have been around and it's just a natural occurrence. You can't avoid it, even though you can go over to Okinawa, Japan, and you can go throughout Japan, and they have one of the lowest heart, heart disease rates anywhere in the world, right? And yet, you would hear an article that would run through the AP, Associated Press, saying that Heart attacks and heart disease is a normal occurrence. It just comes with age, comes with the territory, right? So that's number one. Number two, on the other side of that, you've got the medical establishment, not all, but some who are saying things like you heard that doctor say. But thank, thankfully, you had Dr. Dean Ornish who said, you know what? Genes are not your fate, and that diet is not going to help you. Let me put you on a program, got on a program, and Bill Clinton is still here because of it. You can undo it, right? Now, you need to know this. Here's the third reason why we have these problems. Medical schools offering a single course of nutrition is down, 37%. So you understand... The reason why a doctor like is now, I don't think that that doctor was saying anything malicious. I don't think he was trying to be a bad person. I don't think he was doing anything to hurt. You know, he, he knows his Hippocratic oath, do no harm. And he wasn't trying to do any harm to Bill Clinton. It wasn't malicious. It's simply that they don't get the training. Nutrition has not been a priority in terms of helping people with cardiovascular disease. Well, you can say for any type of lifestyle issue, really. So down 37%. There was a bill introduced by California state legislator to mandate nutritional education for physicians. They tried. It was killed by California Medical Association. They tried. They tried their best. They said a mandate, mandate at least 12 hours of nutrition training any time over the next four years. California Medical Association opposed it, along with California Academy of Family Physicians. The bill was amended from a mandatory minimum of 12 hours to seven. They said, well, we can do seven. And then they kept fighting, they kept fighting, and they got it down to zero. So as it stands, no nutritional education. So this might be a problem. So what does this tell you? What does it say to you tonight? Well, Bill Clinton, he could have kept going about his merry way, eating French fries from McDonald's, quarter pounders, and all that. And the milkshake, by the way, to wash it down. He could have continued to do that. But instead, he heard the voice of someone who was more rational, who was more logical, who had a balanced approach, who had something from thorough research that showed that there are principles of health and nutrition being one of them. And he learned the way. Now, you need to know that he said, well, you know, I still like fish, and I'm going to eat fish. Now, I'm not knocking anybody's diet. I never, anybody who knows me, been to my lectures, I never put down anybody's diet. What you eat is your business. I just give you the information. You're smart people. You'll make the, the right decision. Now, I'm going to be a little, I'm going to urge and nudge a little more this time because of the reasons that I've already stated, right? Care about you. God cares about you. God loves you. And he wants you to be healthy. So I'm going to nudge you a little, little more than I normally do because it's that serious. 
But at the end of the day, it's your choice. Like Bill Clinton. And at the end of the day, he decided, well, I'm still going to eat a little fish. And he did. Guess what happened? Even though they put that stint in his, in his heart, and they opened up those arteries, the moment he started eating that fish, guess what happened? They started to close right back up. And then he saw the wisdom of going total plant-based for his heart. He did it, no more problem. You don't hear about it that much, do you? But Bill Clinton is a vegan. He's a vegan. I like what this says here. Uh, this is a fact. This is science. The Global Burden of Disease Study identified the typical American diet as the primary cause of America's death and disability. The primary cause is simply what you eat. And let me remind you in closing, let me remind you in closing tonight, those here, right here with us in the room, those of you who are streaming on Facebook and on YouTube, let me remind you, if you actually come down with this terrible, terrible situation, it may be, and the science bears this out, it may be because you already have comorbidities or pre-existing conditions. Those pre-existing conditions are things like high blood pressure or hypertension, heart disease, which we're talking about tonight, or you may have diabetes. Here's my goal. Here's our goal. And that is, if you are someone who has these as an issue, let's spend these next three days. Let's talk it out. In fact, let's go beyond that. Let's, even after these next three days and five in total, let's go 10 more sessions, which will be conducted right here, where you can learn how you can overcome the things that you feel like you could never put away. But I urge you, as I said I would, we really must get serious about it. I don't think that things are going to change. This is our new normal. I hate to say it, but it's our new normal. And this might be the easier one. Not that I want it. I'd like to go back to traveling all around and not be on a plane for five and a half hours coming from Maryland to here with a mask on the entire time. There's a loophole, though. They said if you're eating, active eating, you can take the mask off. Problem is, I had to eat for five and a half hours. That's not a good idea. Fact. Fact, more than 100,000 lives per year could be saved if people just increase their consumption of what? Fruits and veggies to meet their dietary guidelines. Very simple. Very, very simple. Okay, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to show you a little video. Uh, this is me on my show um, on From Sickness to Health. And I was sitting down with cardiologist Dr. Schubert Palmer, and he brought in some show and tell items I think you will get a kick of, and it really puts it into perspective. Let me show you that, and we'll close here. <clears throat> From this, which goes in the mouth, to this. Take a look here. This is, uh, this is the amount of fat that you'll see in one cup of skim milk. A skim milk, skim milk. This is in one cup of whole milk. This is almost full. Uh -huh. Now, skim milk tastes pretty nasty, and I must confess, yes. personally, yes. uh, I would much rather this. But there's even a better way, and that is, uh, as we talk about fats, we have the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> All right. And this is pretty much bad fat. Okay. Here is another example. This is three ounces of uh, three ounce fish serving. And then here we have this is a three ounce uh, chicken roasted, no skin. That's halfway full. Halfway full, and that's the uh, the best part of the chicken. So. And this is the yeah. best part of the chicken, yeah. but, but this you know, the is not... The breast without the skin. Without the skin. But this isn't going to affect my heart, is it? Ha! Huh. It definitely does. Oh. It gets even better. This is a regular potato chips. Oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. 
this is completely full mm -hmm. of fat, and you're saying this is 12 to 20 chips, one ounce? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But people love their potato chips. They sit on the couch, they watch the game, and they eat bowls and bowls of them, and they dip them in something that also <laughs> has fat. Well, as I, as I tell my, my patients, you enjoy the, the, you know, this kind of food? I said, you know, it, it is, it's bad for you, but it's good for me. As a heart surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go with, um, this is um, the small size of French fries. That's the amount of fat in a small serving of French fries. Hold up, hold up. This, this is mind blowing to me. This is a small serving of French fries. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about like when they are extra super sized in some way. Mm -hmm. This is the smallest version smallest of me, version. and it fills up a complete a test tube right there. You know, the te but, but I, I want to make sure that we understand this because, you know, someone said, well, that's a small test tube of fat. How, how could this be a bad thing? But you're saying it is. It is because that has to go somewhere. And as you study the circulations, we find out that they land up in the process. Of course, it goes to the liver and then from there on, but it lands up many times in these arteries, the cholesterol the, um, and the fats land up somewhere. So when you're going in as a, as a surgeon and you're looking, now most people are, have never looked inside of a heart. You do mm -hmm. it every day all day, all the time, yes? Uh -huh. And do. what you're seeing is the stuff that we don't think is actually going anywhere except into our stomach is ending up in our hearts and is causing major, major problems. You are what you eat. Garbage in, garbage out. Mercy. Quality in, quality out. Take a look at this one. This is for one hot dog. W what kind of a hot dog? A dead dog. <laughs> 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 a dead dog, hot dog. Okay. And, and here's my favorite. Here's this my one's, favorite. This one's coming out the thing. It's, it's, it's coming. Yeah. But how about the quarter pound cheeseburger? A quarter pounder of cheeseburger. Here is the, the fat in a quarter pound cheeseburger. I'm going to need your help. Help me there. Okay. And that, and that, and that. Uh, I'm sorry. You, you mean one of these? Uh, so All three. This is three. Quarter, quarter pounds of cheese. One serving. One this is one pound. serving. A quarter pound cheeseburger. You know what? I'm going to hold these right here. Let's, because there are a lot of people on the street. What you saw there is what actually is taking place. That really puts it into perspective. And, you know, I don't mean to scare you, but those potato chips. I love potato chips. I do. You say it's such a, especially when you're traveling, you just need something real quick. But when I saw that, I think about it, and I think about how I desire to have things that actually love me. If something goes in and is clogging up, clogging up my arteries, it doesn't love me. Not that these inanimate food items can love you, but food that is alive, it's been designed in such a way that when you put it in, when you consume it, you're benefiting from it. It's not pulling away or taking away. And what I want to encourage us to do as we continue to go from night to night, we're going to continue this theme. Remember Dean Ornish, he said, that same guy who helped Bill Clinton, he said, we need to eat a healthier diet. We need to move more, exercise. We need to, what was that third thing? That was the fourth thing. But that's the one I want to focus on. Stress less. Stress less. Trust more, stress less. But the thing I want to focus on, thank you, Willie, is we want to love more. Love more. Not just, don't just take this as information. I want you to take it and think about it. And when you go and have that breakfast tomorrow morning, and you look down at your plate, you look at what's in the refrigerator, and you ask yourself, does that love me? Will it protect me? Will it defend me? Will it heal me? Will it heal my heart that loves me so much? And if the answer is no, go pick up an apple. Grab a banana. Grab something that's living and that loves you. Is that good enough? Thank you very much. We're going to bring Mark back up.
with a few things that he wants to give away.